The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, over the past six months, you and I have been talking a lot about China-Africa agricultural relations with a particular focus on the Agricultural Technology Demonstration Centers. These are these ATDCs that are scattered around the continent. Uh, For those of you who haven't been following what we've been doing, we've done a number of podcasts on the subject and also on our website. If you look under the tag agriculture, you'll find that we're posting stories almost every week now on different aspects of the China-Africa agricultural relationship. Now, this is a very contentious part of the broader Sino-African discourse, in part because people don't know as much about it. There are historical concerns in Africa about land grabs and about abuse of, of, of agriculture and about also producing food that is then exported out. And there's a lot of misperceptions. And what we've been trying to do in a lot of our coverage is address some of those misperceptions. But Koba, some of those, the the feelings that people have run very, very deep. And today what we're going to try and do is step back from the micro and look at the bigger trends in this relationship, in part, Kobus, because we want to address a lot of these, again, these misperceptions that do seem to cloud the agricultural discourse. A lot of these misperceptions focus on what China is trying to get out of this relationship. So there's a lot of a lot of discourse about oh, Africa is going to be farming, and then all of the food will be exported to China. Um, you know, and, and there's a, there's a lot of kind of misinformation in in those those discourses. But what they also leave out is exactly what Africa is getting from the relationship. You know, it tends to be very focused on what China wants rather than what Africa is trying to get. Now, one of the reasons why there are so many misperceptions is in part because both Chinese and African stakeholders in this part of the relationship don't seem to really communicate about it very much. I mean, I can't think of, you know, a time when uh, Zhao Lijian, the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman, has talked about it or if they've done information. They don't have a lot of social media presence. When we've tried to interview various stakeholders on the Chinese side, they say they're not ready yet. Uh, They want to do more time. They've been doing this for years now and they're still not ready on the African side, in various countries, we've been we've had more success. We've got a lot of journalists to speak with us, but again, it's all fragmented, and there isn't the big picture. And so that's why we're thrilled to have on the program today Isaac Lothar. Uh, he's a PhD student uh, pursuing his, his doctoral degree at the University of Toronto in Chinese politics and international relations. He wrote a paper a couple of years ago for Third World Quarterly called "Why African Countries Are Interested in Building Agricultural Partnerships with China." Lessons from Rwanda and Uganda. Isaac, very good morning to you, and thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to meet you on the podcast. Well, it's really great to have you on and to talk again about some of the the bigger trends and and, and these issues that have affected the China-Africa agricultural relationship. Let's talk about those misperceptions just so we can get them out of the way. Uh, Professor Deborah Braudigam at Johns Hopkins University wrote a whole book on Will Africa Feed China, where she tried to kind of dispel some of these myths. Uh, you writ- wrote a paper, and in your paper you said that a lot of the initial discourse and a lot of when you were doing your interviews with dozens of stakeholders, uh, these misperceptions were front and center. So talk to us a little bit about what those misperceptions are and why you think that they still very much influence the, the discussion on agriculture. Yeah, so I mean, it's uh, it, it's this sort of Chinese land grabbing is uh, you know almost a like a zombie topic, or it doesn't it doesn't matter how many times you shoot it down, it it seems to keep on reappearing. Um, when I was doing my research, uh, when I started doing my research, you know, in around 2014, if you were to Google uh, Chinese African affairs at that time, overwhelmingly you would get articles from The Economist, The New York Times, and different um, Western publications that suggested that China was purchasing, you know, large, large swaths of land uh, across the African continent. Uh, And so as I started to do a bit more digging in the sort of the early stages of of my research, I found that these claims, they made a lot of sense sort of in theory, uh, but there wasn't an enormous amount of 
um, evidence that actually substantiated these claims. And so, did in, in your in your research, did you find any examples of of large scale land buying by Chinese in Africa? In my own research, uh, the the time I spent in Rwanda and Uganda, no, I did not find there was no indication that there were any sort of large purchase, purchases of of uh, you know pieces of land. I think the biggest um, investment or sort of, um, you know, by, by hectares was in the range of, of 20 hectares. Uh, now this is not to say that, you know, large purchases of, of big areas of land by Chinese investors, uh, doesn't exist. Uh, it's just that that's not the, the sort of the main driver, uh, behind Chinese investments across the African continent. Uh, but in my own research, no, I didn't find, uh, any evidence to suggest that there was that there was um, you know large purchases of land in in Rwanda or Uganda uh, and uh, you know one of the reasons that I chose to focus my research in Rwanda and Uganda is that uh, you know R Rwanda is perhaps one of the least likely places across the African continent that foreign investors would choose to purchase large amounts of land uh, largely because you, you know Rwanda is uh, sort of in the the highlands as it moves as the African continent moves west um, towards uh, uh, the sort of uh, the, the Democratic Republic, Republic of the Congo, uh, and then also the the um, demonstration center in Uganda was focused on aquaculture, so it, it had very little to do with land. Uh, so, so some of the reasons that I chose these uh, these two projects was uh, because it, it, it sort of inferred uh, that they were not grabbing land. When I raised this issue with a Chinese professor uh, in China, and I said, kind of. What's the thing, thinking on your side about these land grab issues? Uh, she chuckled about it because she said it's so ill-informed. And, and people who say this have no concept of the enormity of China's food demands. This is a country of 1.3 billion people. And small-scale agriculture in Africa simply cannot feed China. It needs U.S., Brazilian, Argentinian, European-scale agriculture to provide it the, the quantities of food that it needs. So it doesn't even make sense on that level. And when you actually see about the, the, the scale that China imports food, Africa is simply not positioned to do that. So that's what, that was her assessment. I thought that was a really nice way of putting this misperception to rest. We're, we're not going to talk about that anymore because we want to kind of move, move the discussion forward past that. But I thought it was important for us just to address that up front. Uh, you posed the question in your paper why is it that African countries are, in fact, keen to collaborate with China in their agricultural development? Uh, let's start there with that question, and in particular, comparing and contrasting, say, what the Chinese are doing in agriculture in Africa compared to, say, what traditional legacy donors are doing. Right. So um, what the Chinese uh, investors are doing is they're, they're focusing on, as you mentioned in the introduction, these agriculture technology demonstration centers. Uh, and so what's different about these centers than, than um, you know, uh, your sort of average Western investors that uh, these demonstration centers are built around sort of physical infrastructure uh, that China contributes to the agricultural sectors uh, of, of the, the host uh, countries. So if you get a grant, you know, if, if you're an African country and you're getting some sort of some, a grant or a loan or, or some form of aid from, say, the United States or Canada or uh, a country in the European Union, usually that is going to be some form of cash injection that uh, the country is going to be able to use uh, to direct towards some sort of existing project. What's different about the Chinese projects is that the, the Chinese come and they actually contribute to building uh, research infrastructure or uh, different types of infrastructure that can uh, help these sort of research arms of ministries of agriculture uh, in, in the countries that they partner with. So from the African perspective, what, what are some of the pluses of working with China rather than working with legacy donors? Lots of different uh, participants in, in my study and lots of different people that I spoke with uh, had, had different answers. But there was one answer that I think came up uh, consistently across the two countries. Uh, and that was that, that, you know, the Chinese agricultural economy, uh, the, the domestic economy and uh, agricultural economy in China is fewer steps removed from the agricultural practices of African farmers. Uh, so the sort of the the demonstrations and the agricultural technologies that uh, China introduces uh, in uh, in in Africa are much easier to adopt um, for small scale farmers. 
Now, this does not necessarily mean that China is, or, or that the, the technology demonstration centers are contributing to, uh, you know, uh, what I would say are sort of pro-poor um, development strategies. They're, they're not targeting um, the smallest uh, subs- subsistence scale farmers. Um, they, a lot of the projects are contributing more so to, um, you know, mid-level, uh, mid-tier, uh, farmers who have some sort of ability to, to purchase, uh, inputs. To purchase what? To purchase, um, so for example, in Rwanda, the demonstration center focused on mushroom cultivation. Uh, and so, you know, mushroom cultivation, it, it's a highly, uh, leveraged, agricultural practice. So you have to, there's, there's a lot of inputs that go into mushroom cultivation. So if you're a small scale subsistence farmer, you're not going to be able to afford a lot of the inputs that are required to become some sort of profitable um, mushroom grower within uh, the agricultural uh, sector in Rwanda. Uh, the same can be said about the, uh, the demonstration in Uganda. The uh, demonstration center in Uganda was focused on uh, fish farming. Uh, and so, you know, fish farming is, is again, not something that a small scale subsistence um, agriculturalist in, in Uganda is going to be able to uh, afford to do. Uh, y- you have to buy uh, fingerling or, or fry, which are the sort of the brood stock um, uh, that's required in, uh, for aquaculture. Uh, so you need to have a, the farmers that benefit most from the Chinese demonstrations are those that have some sort of of capital that they can use uh, to um, start some sort of agricultural practice. So, you know, kind of one, one of the biggest issues in, in China-Africa relations is the issue of skills transfer. And there's incredible, you know, incredible demand from Africa for skills transfer in, in almost every, every aspect of the economy you can name. How successful do you feel skills transfer has actually been in the agricultural demonstration center context? You know, is, uh, do you actually see a, a marked difference in the way that people farm before the center and, and after the center? One of the biggest challenges that I encountered when I was uh, doing my study was following up with farmers who had attended the demonstrations, um, the, the the demonstrations that had had been conducted uh, at the the demonstration centers. It was it was very difficult to get in contact um, with the people who had who had been trained in mushroom farming in uh, Rwanda or in, in aquaculture uh, in Uganda. So. It was. It, it, it's difficult to say whether or not it, there was a lot of uptake uh, of of the strategies uh, and the the, def, the different demonstrations um, beyond the the um, the specific place where uh, the demonstration center existed. However, the technicians, the uh, the technicians in Rwanda and in Uganda, definitely seemed to think that they had learned an awful lot. Uh, from the demonstration centers. So in Rwanda, um, having the Chinese around to keep working with the uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and work alongside the Ministry of Agriculture uh, to help them as they sort of encountered issues uh, in mushroom growing was was very, very helpful. Uh, and in Uganda, um, the technicians at the, uh, the, the Uganda technicians at the demonstration center uh, were quite happy with a lot of the the things that they'd seen uh, the Chinese demonstrate. Um, for example, there was a, a method of um, selecting, uh, or uh, so when you're farming fish uh, at the uh, brood stage, the the fry stage, and the fingerling stage, you want to encourage size specific uh, competition among ju- juvenile fish. Um, so there's a number of what, what you have to do is you have to basically separate. Uh, smaller fish from larger fish at the juvenile stage, uh, because if you keep small fish and large fish together, the larger fish are just going to outcompete the smaller fish for food, and uh, you're gonna you're gonna lose uh, a lot of the stock. So there's a number of different ways that you can basically uh, sort through the sizes of the different fish, and the Chinese had a certain way of sorting through the brood stock and organizing the brood stock in a way that was quite helpful and quite beneficial to the. Uh, the technicians at uh, the Ugandan center. So there was certainly some um, uptake of of the skills that had been developed or demonstrated to the centers uh, among the technicians, but it's difficult to say how much that 
uh, spread beyond the centers. I still can't figure out from all the research and reading and talking to you as to what scale these ATDCs are working on. That is, is it a, a micro scale working with farmers in a community and in, in a region, but not necessarily on a national scale in a country like Rwanda or Uganda? Or is the impact that these centers are having larger than just the people who are interacting with the facility? What's the scale that they're working on? Well, a lot of that will depend on, on the size of the country. Uh, so in Rwanda, the scale was uh, quite national because Rwanda, is, it's just a smaller country. So it wasn't particularly difficult for the the um, technicians working at the center to go out and do demonstrations in the field, uh, nor was it particularly difficult for them to get um, participants from many different regions uh, across Rwanda. Um, Uganda is, you know, it's, it's a larger country. So I think this sort of the outreach of the center, the center is stationed in uh, an area called Kajansi, which is uh, just south of Kampala. So a lot of the fish farmers that they were working with were from that region. I mean, I don't think that they were going far into the north or they didn't have an enormous amount of outreach into the, the north of the country. Um, but it, it, the, the outreach of the center is definitely beyond just the sort of the immediate vicinity uh, of the center itself. Uh, again, as I, I mentioned before, it was it, there wasn't an awful lot of information uh, about how many people had actually been trained at the center or uh, you know the ability to follow up with people who had been trained at the center. Both centers had their own sort of numbers of how many people they thought they had trained. Uh, in Rwanda, they thought they'd trained roughly twelve to 1,500 farmers. Uh, in mushroom cultivation, uh, whereas in Uganda, I, I, I interviewed one person. I think he he said that they he estimated that between ten and fifteen thousand people had benefited directly or indirectly from the demonstration center. I couldn't confirm that. I can't confirm that that's how many people actually benefited from it. But that he he seemed to think that that's roughly how many people were were benefiting from the center. And have you seen, you know, kind of subsequent to the work of the center, that that the mushrooms and fish that they that they were that they were starting to cultivate and, and, you know, the skills for those kind of farming that, that were transferred, did those actually shift the, the, the food economy in those regions? Do you, do you know, kind of were mushrooms and fish, you know, kind of becoming more of a staple in the markets or more, you know, did it actually have like a, you know, a real world impact? In Rwanda, I mean, everyone and their neighbors seems to have been trained in in mushroom cultivation. Whether or not that was from the Chinese center was uh, not always the case. The Chinese were not the only people training Rwandans in mushroom cultivation. So again, it's difficult to say exactly how many people who learned how to grow mushrooms um, were benefiting or or who had been trained at the Chinese center. Um, what I can say, though, is that you know there is a, uh, a sort of a burgeoning mushroom sector within Rwanda, and so many of the private companies that were selling uh, mushrooms and, and different mushroom products had at some point learned something from the Chinese, or had at some point bought products uh, from the Chinese demonstration center. Uh, so you certainly are seeing lots and lots of mushroom products uh, across Rwanda, and it. I think in in some ways it's directly related to the the demonstration center. Some ways I think that it's probably more diffusely represented or um, related to the the demonstration center. Uh, with respect to uh, Uganda, so the demonstration center in Uganda, they were trying to the, the demonstration center in Uganda before the Chinese actually arrived uh, did have some commercial operations. So they would do research. Uh, they would do training, and then they would also sell the brood stock of um, of Nile tilapia. Um, so, what the demonstration center had allowed the technicians to do uh, at the the demonstration center in Uganda was that they basically increased the productive capacity of of brood stock. Uh, so, while you're not necessarily seeing, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be seeing more fish or more. F- fish from the Chinese center directly. It means that there were uh, more fish farmers who were able to purchase broodstock uh, from the demonstration center than there had been in the past. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. 
The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at VitsChinaAfrica or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. One of the pieces of feedback that we've been getting in our discussions about the uh, agricultural technology demonstration centers is that there's been some cultural challenges, uh, linguistic challenges. There's also, it's there's a lot of public-private participation. So some of the companies, the Chinese companies that are involved, sometimes have a different agenda or time frame or ambitions than, say, the development side or the local farmers. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the, the cultural human interaction aspects of all this and some of the ways that they overcame those challenges in other areas where they weren't able to. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd, I'd start by saying that, uh, of course, when you have any two cultures coming together, there's going to be difficulties and it's it's going to be awkward and it's going to be challenging. I don't necessarily think that the challenges that the Rwandan technicians or the Ugandan technicians had with their Chinese counterparts was any more difficult or challenging uh, than, you know, I had with Rwandan technicians or what I had with uh, the Chinese technicians. Uh, so there's, you know, sometimes I, I think that uh, there's this sort of perception that uh, the sort of the cultural interactions between Chinese and, and uh, Africans is unique, uniquely awkward, uh, which is, is really not the case. Uh, the, the sort of the cultural barriers are basically what you would expect uh, between, you know, different groups of people that, that don't speak the same language. Um, so the sort of the day-to-day -day functioning uh, between the, the, the Chinese and their African counterparts you would have some sort of, uh, you know, language issues. I think it's probably their challenges uh, with relating to one another, uh, you know, on, on sort of personal levels beyond the professional because so much of, of what they're doing is sort of uh, through mimed interaction. Uh, if, if, you know, the, the Chinese uh, technicians don't know the word for something that they're trying to explain. So the day-to-day -day interactions, I mean, there's nothing particularly remarkable about the, the, the sort of the cultural differences. Um, where it became more problematic was when you would have um, the sort of the, the actual demonstrations. Um, so, for example, in Uganda, the, um, the Chinese technicians working at the Ugandan center, I think there was only one or two of them that actually spoke English. So they had a full-time translator with them. Uh, but when they were doing the demonstrations, uh, you know, the translator was not trained in technical scientific language that relates to aquaculture. Uh, so the, it was difficult, I think, uh, to navigate when, when they needed to. It was difficult to navigate the technical language of, of farming. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, the the Ugandan center they had a, a translator who was translating everything into English. Well, the problem was that a lot of the people who came to the demonstrations didn't speak English. Uh, in fact, a lot of the people that came to the demonstration centers you know, had spoke all different sorts of languages. Uh, so, if you have the Chinese, you know, it's it, it's sort of a, an issue of broken telephone because you have the Chinese technicians who are demonstrating what they're doing that's then translated uh, by a Chinese translator that a Ugandan technician then interprets from the, the, the English translation, which they then have to reinterpret into uh, several different languages as they explain it to the participants in the demonstration. So I think that that was something that was sort of more unique to, uh, to Uganda just because of how many different languages are spoken in Uganda. In Rwanda, that wasn't necessarily the case um, because most people in Rwanda speak, uh, you know, Kenya Rwanda, uh, French or English. Uh, and so it, it wasn't as much of an issue. It wasn't as much of a, a broken telephone issue, uh, I think, at, at the Rwandan demonstrations. In, in African development circles, there's a lot of talk always about the possibility of mass agriculture and agri-processing um, as, a, as a development path for Africa. And there's also then people, you know, kind of pointing out that the, the gap between that dream and and the current situation with a very relatively low skill, very rural, small holder farmer population. Um, and, you know, kind of the different discussions about how to make the leap between that and this kind of idea of Africa as a as a kind of a breadbasket to the world, exporting food everywhere. How solid a link between those two things, those, those, you know, between between the current reality and, and these kind of future plans, do you feel these agricultural demonstrations 
represent you know demonstration centers do you know how 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 much are they helping Africa to move from the one to the other well I mean if Africa wants to become a, a sort of a large agriculture uh, exporting hub they're going to need large vertically integrated agricultural firms and the agricultural technology demonstration centers do not offer that. So when I say a large um, vertically integrated firm, what I mean is a firm that can operate at multiple stages in the upstream processing of agricultural commodities. So that means you need a firm or a company that's basically able to um, produce food or grain at a very large scale. They then need to be able to store that grain uh, in in storage facilities uh, that the stored grain then needs to be able to be transported to a port. The port then needs to transport it to another country. Uh, in the other country, it then needs to get stored in another um, facility or processing facility, and then it goes to market. So to turn Africa into some large uh, exporting uh, you know, breadbasket, you need large firms that are able to uh, integrate themselves at multiple um, points along the agricultural supply chain. The agricultural technology demonstration centers do not do that. Um, Uganda already exports some fish to the European Union and to different European countries. Uh, and so the technology demonstration center in a, in a sort of diffuse way uh, contributes to that in that they're just increasing the, the productivity of, of um, fish farming in Uganda. So it's it's not a direct link. It's not a direct contribution. Um, you know, and in addition to that, in, in Rwanda, I mean, the, there were a number of different uh, sort of crops and, and technologies that were demonstrated demonstrated at the, the center. But they sort of converged on, uh, or they, they committed themselves to to demonstrating mushrooms or, or uh, you know, mushroom cultivation. Um, mushrooms are not a great export crop. They, they go bad pretty quick. Uh, it's it's not easy to put to store mushrooms to put them on a plane uh, to send them somewhere else. Uh, it, most countries that are are consuming mushrooms are producing the mushrooms locally. Um, so you, you can I mean you can dry mushrooms, but I, I don't think there's a huge market for dried oyster mushrooms, which is m- most of what they were growing in Rwanda. So in terms of bridging some sort of link between uh, you know small scale producers in Africa and trying to access large international markets, I don't see a direct link between the Chinese demonstration centers uh, and accessing that market. One of the areas that I've been puzzled by is that about these ATDCs is that there seems to be a disconnect. And, and this not this doesn't necessarily re- relate to your research per se, but China has said it's opening up its market to not only African, but also South Asian, South American agricultural importers from around the world. It's really trying to promote this idea that it is open. And in some ways, there's a geopolitical aspect to all of it simply because as the United States is becoming more restrictive in its trade and adding tariffs, the Chinese want to make themselves more open. But at the same time, what we've seen over the past year, say, take avocados from Kenya, is that there are a lot of restrictions and guidelines imposed on agricultural products that make a lot of sense. So for example, in Kenya, in order to export an avocado to China, it has to be flash frozen. And this is the same in a number of different products. But if you can actually get your product aligned, the tariffs are quite low going into China, and there's a big market and a big opportunity. We've seen that with Rwandan coffee, uh, Kenyan tea. There's a number of product areas. And it just seems to me like there's an opportunity for the ATDCs to position themselves in such a way is to work with local farmers and exporters in order to facilitate preparation of products in order to be sent to China so that it can do a couple of different things. Number one, it can provide a market for the farmers to export. It can help address some of the trade balance issues. And it puts a purpose that is for the ATDCs that is in some ways win-win, which is what the Chinese always talk about. Again, this is not necessarily something that you did any research on, but I I was just curious to see if you had any thoughts on that. Uh, Thoughts on how it is that the ATDCs could potentially direct themselves towards? Could be, and the potential to help local farmers better access the China market, which they've had difficulty doing. So one link that the ATDCs do have with the Chinese market is that the Chinese technicians can act uh, to help them, you know, import 
sort of hard agricultural goods like like uh, you know machines and stuff like that, um, things that they need for agricultural import uh, inputs. Uh, so that that is uh, one link that that the um, demonstration centers do provide. Uh, whether or not the demonstration centers could provide a link to you know uh, export exporting to China. Um, I mean, I, you know, my personal opinion is that I think that they would be better serviced if they were to target uh, African markets. Uh, and I do think that the, the demonstration centers could be helpful uh, in, in targeting local markets instead of just targeting um, the, the Chinese market. Um, in, in terms of how they could do it, one of the problems with the demonstration centers is that there's a sort of lack of centralized coordination. Uh, I didn't get the sense that there was an awful lot of learning that was happening between the demonstration centers. Uh, so I think that if they wanted to, uh, to transition these demonstration centers into something that would be better suited to access uh, international markets, I think that the demonstration centers or the different uh, firms, universities, companies that run the demonstration centers would need to kind of come together and share their experiences um, to see if there had been success at any of the demonstration centers in accessing uh, international markets, and then to see how they went about doing it, and uh, and see how that could be transitioned or, or translated to some of the other demonstration centers. That's a great point to be able to do more cross pollination in terms of lessons and learning uh, within the ATDCs. That's a, a great kind of place for us to leave our discussion. Uh, Isaac Lothar is pursuing his PhD at the University of Toronto in Chinese politics and international relations. He's done quite a bit of research uh, for years into China-Africa uh, agricultural relationships and wrote a paper a couple of years ago, which I'll put a link to in our show notes, Why African Countries Are Interested in Building Agricultural Partnerships with China, Lessons from Rwanda and Uganda. It was published in Third World Quarterly. Apparently, that's a very reputable journal that, you know, those of us outside of academia think it's bizarre and how unwoke that name is. But nonetheless, apparently there's a journal called Third World Quarterly and uh, very reputable, you both tell me. So, OK, I'll go with that. Uh, Isaac, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if people want to follow what you're reading and writing these days, are you on social media? OK. <laughs> Well, we'll, well, as soon as you're on Twitter and have your brand new, freshly made account, send us the link. We'll include it in the show notes. And Cobus, I have to say it's refreshing that we're seeing more young academics actually get onto these internets, you know, and get caught up with, uh, with the times these days. Because a few years ago when we, when we interviewed academics, it was almost a guarantee that they didn't have a social media account. And not only did they have no social media accounts, they had disdain for social media. Is that, am I characterizing this correctly, Kobus? I think I think it's it's was fear masters this day, but yeah. <laughs> so it's really encouraging to see you know the 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 wonky types kind of get with the times. So uh, you know, well, we're very excited to to promote your new Twitter account uh, again. Isaac Lotter, PhD student at the University of Toronto in Chinese politics and international relations, joining us from Toronto. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Take care. Kobus, it was refreshing to get that high-level overview and a very balanced view, I thought, uh, of the ATDCs and China's agricultural development. I still think it's an area where both Africans and Chinese can do better in communicating what they're doing. And it was interesting for me the fact that communication does seem to be a challenge for the Chinese, even within the ATDC network uh, that exists within Africa. Not surprising, the Chinese do have lots of communication issues uh, in, in, in many aspects of their foreign policy. So the fact that agriculture is part of that doesn't really surprise me. Yeah, I completely agree. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think it also raises the need for African countries to be working much closer together on these issues. Um, you know, obviously Africa at the moment is, is really trying to, to integrate continentally uh, and particularly to integrate trade continentally. Um, and agriculture is going to play a very, very big role in that. Um, so, you know, it would be great if African countries could work more closely together to also maximize the kind of skills transfer that's happening. You know, kind of there, there's a lot of a lot of outside actors, you know, transferring skills to particular African communities. It would be great if those communities could could transfer those skills to each other. 
And as we think about Africa in the post-COVID-19 era, whenever that will be, it's probably going to be a situation where agriculture could be a big employer because I think the dreams of the African renaissance in terms of industrialization and manufacturing are going to be postponed and delayed simply because the capital isn't going to be there. The demand for a lot of the products that would be, that would be made uh, is probably going to be depressed. And the fact that here in Southeast Asia, they're doing exceptionally well in absorbing a lot of that Chinese offshoring, that there really isn't the need to, to go to a place like Africa. So what will employ all of these people? And agriculture is a potential employer. And it's one of the areas where Kenyan economist David Ndi has been talking about because he is really a critic of the massive infrastructure loans, like for the Standard Gauge Railway, which he says doesn't actually help the development of human capital. One of the areas that he talks about is education, agriculture in these areas, which actually helps people in the more immediate sense. So again, I think David and Dee's thoughts on this are very, very interesting, and it does play very nicely into what some of the things that the Chinese are doing. The one area which I would like to, us to look into more is some of the comparisons between, say, what the ATDCs are doing and what, say, the British are doing with DFID or USAID or the Swedes are doing and some of the legacy donors. The Americans will tell you that they commit more money and they've done more at much larger scale in Africa, but I'd still like to have a better understanding on effectiveness and what the outcomes are between the Chinese approach and, say, the U.S. European approach. What I'd also like to see in addition to that is more um, kind of hard-nosed comparisons of of how China moved from from a system of, of multiple kind of small agricultural smallholders towards development and to, particularly towards also agricultural fuel development and whether any of that is applicable in Africa because obviously Africa has a lot of land and it has lots of small-scale farmers um, but they're not nearly as well integrated into the market as Chinese farmers are so you know so, so there's a lot there to unpack you know how to how to not you know necessarily pave over into massive kind of mega farms, how to maintain those rural economies, but yet plug them into the, into the larger national economy. This is one of the areas where it might not be helpful to look at the Chinese model, simply because, and Deborah Braudigam laid this out in her book, Will Africa Feed China, that the Chinese agricultural system is very much unique to the communist revolution that was there and the communist system that's in China. And so in that sense, an authoritarian, totalitarian system in the way that land is allocated may not have applications in Africa. This is why, again, and I keep coming back to this theme, that there might be lessons here in ASEAN countries, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which in many ways more closely resembles Africa than what China does. Here in Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and whatnot, where they have a variety of political systems, it's mostly agrarian, it's commodity-based exporting, and it's at the basically the same GDP level as most African countries. So I would encourage people, and I think there's a lot of academic potential, research potential, to be starting to compare ASEAN and Africa more than, say, China and Africa. What do you think on that? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that that makes sense. I mean, in some cases in Africa, like Tanzania, notably, you know, there was forms of kind of Mao inspired collectivized agriculture, but but a lot of those have fallen apart to the extent where I don't think they're really usable as a foundation for anything anymore. So I don't think you they know, have the centralized I, system the way the Chinese have. It. Yes, yes. Um, so yeah, I completely agree that 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 ASEAN countries are, are a great place to learn from. I think there would this should also be a lot of focus on on what different African countries can can deliver to each other, you know, kind of because Africa has, has such like massively varied landscape um, that you know different. There's there's a, a lot of potential for lots of different crops and a lot of, of uh, cross border trade um, potential. I think, um, and it'll be interesting to see how different African countries respond to the needs of other African countries. If you're interested in this topic, we have got a wealth of information on our website, ChinaAfricaProject.com. Find an article, click on the tag Agriculture. In fact, uh, we worked with uh, Development Reimagined, which is the Beijing-based consultancy, and they did. A a, 
a full kind of breakdown of what are the ATDCs, what do they do, are they effective. Uh, we'll put a link to that in our show notes as well because I think it's very instructive for our conversation today. Uh, but agriculture is one of these issues that we are covering more in our podcast along with sustainability and climate change and some of these other issues that for the most part have been pushed off the agenda during these very, very turbulent times with COVID-19, also with the U.S., China, Africa, tensions, geopol geopolitical turmoil and whatnot. So all of that is covered in our daily newsletter, the politics and the debt trap and all of that stuff, those kind of memes. Uh, whereas on our, on our podcast, what we're trying to do is kind of take some of these other issues and put them into the discourse. So if you'd like to follow us on our newsletter, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. We've got a special offer just for our podcast listeners, a uh, big, giant, massive discount if you, you enter the promo code podcast, P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Uh, once again, go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Cobus and I put this newsletter out every day. It's really a labor of love for us. It takes about 12 hours to crank out every day, and but we love it, and it's a very, very deep dive into uh, China-Africa issues. There's nothing else really like it out there because I don't think anybody's crazy enough to spend as much time sifting through all of the news sources in French, English, Arabic, Chinese, and then kind of putting together what we think of as really a snapshot of the day's conversations about China-Africa relations. We'd love for you to give it a try. Try it out free for two weeks. If you don't like it, you can cancel anytime. I love the fact that people are trying it out. Even if they don't sign up, just give it a try. And we'd love for you to see what, what's going on there. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Cobus and I will be back again next week with another show. So for Cobus Van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Gwobas at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.